Where is the NDIS up to in New South Wales? Well, this is how the rollout is happening. Um, pretty much half of us by July of this year, the rest of us by July of next year. So the NDIS has two parts, which I'm sure you're all vaguely aware of. One part is all of the individualised support packages, so the individual bits of money that people get to purchase their own supports. And the other is this broader idea that's been a little bit, um, shall we say, nebulous, uh, a little bit aspirational. Uh, in other words, we're not really sure of the detail really at all yet. And that's what was originally called Tier 2, but we now call it Information Linkages and ca Capacity Building. So these are the broader services, the broader scope of organisations and mainstream organisations as well that are supposed to pick up the pieces for the people who will not, who may still have a disability or mental illness but won't necessarily qualify or be eligible for an individual support package. But very generally, you can read um, basically what it is. It's really sort of about capacity building in mainstream services and linking people into um, sort of mainstream activities and leisure events and services in their local area. Um, and it might also include some of the broader programs that, that we're all um, involved with. LACs have replaced NDIA planners. Um, in most cases, there's two agencies that are LACs. It was Direct Tender. So one is St Vincent's and the other is Uniting Care and they pretty much do half of the state each. And so they do all the groundwork. So um, in terms of the actual planning process, it'll be someone from St Vincent's or Uniting Care who talks uh, to the family or to the person with a disability and does all that groundwork. And then they give all the information back to the NDIA who actually make the decision about funding. My understanding is if you're in the NDIS before you turn 65, it will continue after you turn 65. Oh, so it doesn't go to aged care? No. Because they're, you can choose, but um, generally the supports are dis disability specific. If you actually required aged care services, then obviously you would go into the aged care system for those specific services. But yes, my understanding is you can stay through. Okay, so to become an NDIS participant, a person must have a permanent disability that significantly affects their ability to take part in everyday activities, be under 65 when they first enter, be an Australian citizen or hold a permanent visa or protected special category visa and live in a place where the NDIS is available. So obviously you can't access it if it hasn't rolled out yet. So what about people living with a mental illness? The NDIS is not diagnostically based. It's based on functional capacity. Um, so if somebody has um, a permanent illness or disability that inhibits their ability in their day-to-day -day life to do the things they need to do um, or that affects their quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis, then in theory they should be eligible. So it's actually regardless of, of diagnosis. Um, of course having a diagnosis helps support your case and there are some common diagnoses that um, you know, the NDIA will recognise and automatically know, OK, well, this is going to give you some si significant problems. But it's actually not the, the critical factor in being eligible for a plan. So as far as mental illness goes, it must result in a psychosocial disability. That's what the NDIA have stipulated. Um, and give them a significant problem in undertaking everyday tasks. Now, I know, f you know, for a lot of people, this is an episodic um, thing and that does make it difficult, um, you know, I'm not going to pull any punches, makes it difficult in terms of meeting eligibility criteria. Um, and I think th at the moment, sort of the NDIS is thinking, the NDIA is thinking is that uh, a lot of those people will be supported under the Tier 2, the broader scheme that we talked about. So, ultimately, eligibility rests with the National Disability Insurance Agency and they have tools and et cetera, et cetera, um, that will determine that. As much evidence as you can provide about the person's lack of capacity, lack of functional ability, about the impact on their day-to-day -day life, the better, the more likely you're going to get a favourable result. What can I expect? The process for new applicants in New South Wales. You, as I mentioned, you can expect them to contact you um, particularly if you're already getting service provision. If not, you can go on the website and there's a little form, a um, little eligibility kind of tool you can use on the website and you can put your information in there. And from, there, from that, they will actually contact you as well. 
Um, you complete your f necessary forms. They will assess you and give you a notification around eligibility. Um, then you'll have contact from the LAC, from either Uniting or St Vinnie's, and they'll set up a planning meeting, an information gathering meeting with you. Um, they'll then submit that to the NDIA, who's the ones who will finalise and approve the budget. Um, and then if you've got issues going on after that, you'll have ongoing contact with your LAC, but you won't necessarily have any ongoing contact with the NDIA. <coughs> you implement the plan. Um, the plans are supposed to be all around building the capacity of the person and achieving their personal goals, but we also know from the My First Plan thing that that might slip a little bit by the wayside for the first year. And then you come up to your first year review, and if you're on a My First Plan, then it's in the second year that you're likely to actually start to be able to do some goal setting and some further planning around that. Where do carers fit? Well, as I said, you don't, don't get to have a plan in our own right. We don't get to purchase services for ourselves under the NDI. A, und under the NDIS, unless you actually yourself have a disability that makes you eligible, um, and that's something separate. Um, you can't purchase supports within your care recipient's plan either, unless they're for very, very specific things like training you in manu manual handling or, or something like that. So it's not really about <laughs> your own support, but it is about how you might support the person better. You can obviously contribute information and evidence in the assessment process. You can be involved in all the planning. Um, you can participate. You can communicate what your needs and limitations are. And it's really, really important that that, that is done. Um, carers need to be able to go forward in the meeting and say, no, I'm not capable. I've been doing this for 20 years, but I cannot do it anymore. All right? I can't shower this person every day. You know, that's it. I can't cope with these outbursts every day, whatever it is. They need to be empowered to go forth in the meeting and state those things. Otherwise, the NDA won't know, the LAC won't know if, it, if we don't tell them. Um, and you can ask for supports to, 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 su to sustain the caring role as well. You can request them. Um, all of these things have to, have to happen with the participant's consent. So the starting point for the NDIA is that the person has capacity. That is the assumption they will make about every single applicant, that they have capacity to have choice and control over their own lives, and until they find otherwise, that's the assumption that they will maintain. So the other thing I should mention is you can provide a carer statement which can outline all of the impacts and on your life and the things that you desire and what your limitations are. Uh, when you deal with the LACs, they may never have never heard of a carer statement, some staff in the NDIA have never heard of a carer statement, even though it's in their guidelines. But we strongly encourage you to write a statement and lodge it with them so that it's, it's in there and you've articulated um, you know, what your own needs are and what your own limitations are. But there is a process for appointing a nominee. So if the NDIA go in and they see that the person really has very little capacity to make unsupported decisions, um, they can have an, a nominee appointed. But that doesn't necessarily mean the carer. It could be a support worker, it could be, could even be a teacher, it depends um, on the situation. Question we've had is, is it correct that if a person refuses assistance, a carer cannot apply for the NDIS on their behalf? No, that's not true. You can apply on their behalf, but if they refuse to participate, that's when it becomes a sticking issue and um, it can be quite difficult then to get the NDIA to continue to be involved if someone's completely refusing um, all kinds of supports and services. But I do work for an organisation called Inner Sydney Voice and we are an advocacy organisation and we work very hard to advocate for people, especially those um, that don't have a voice for themselves. But my understanding of um, the mental health um, and psychosocial aspects of the NDIS is that it's fairly clearly laid out in the NDIA schedule about um, severe and persistent um, and that is fine when it's on paper, but it has, in the pilot regions, my understanding that has been very dependent on the um, skills of the person doing the assessment. And so there have been very um, varying degrees. You can take, you know, Bill and Bob, and they're both identical, two different assessors, and they come out with two very different packages, or one will come out with a package, one won't come out with a package at all. Um, and so that is problematic. There's also evidence that, depending on who's sort of at the top of the pie, uh, the top of the pile in terms of talking about what supports should be allocated, um, it differs even from state to state. So certainly, um, New South Wales uh, people that have got packages um, under the mental health 
for NDIS. Um, it's much more about daily living skills mm. in New South Wales. In Victoria, it's been more about dependent um, community access, all those kinds of things. So even from state to state, it's proved to be very um, variable. So the answer to that, I think, is to ensure that within all the assessment teams and the LACs, that they have mental health and um, psychosocial specialist teams um, because it is a very specialist area and I think that that's an area that's lacking at the moment and I would advise you guys to go out and advocate for that and I would imagine that um, guys like um, Mental Health Carers New South Wales and ourselves would be happy to advocate on your behalf for that to take place. But there's also um, an issue um, that I've heard around uh, the LACs, so St Vincent's and Uniting Care, um, writing up plans for uh, clients, those plans being presented to the NDIA and being declined. So I think this is a little bit about where Douglas mentions um, there's that 200,000 people that probably aren't going to receive packages. I think that's a way of culling out some of those people. Um, and I would certainly suggest that... Um, <laughs> whoever is going for a package takes somebody with them, a friend, a carer, a service provider, anyone that can help support them and um, advocate on their behalf. Well, it, I think it's a little bit too early to really talk about people being left out of the NDIS at this stage. In the pilot site in Hunter, they um, had a group of people who were found to be ineligible initially, and I think it was about 60 or so people and then um, ADEC actually supported them to apply again with better evidence. And most of them got through um, sort of the second time around. There were a few people who didn't get through, but those were the people who used a little bit of um, support services here and there, ad hoc basis. So they'd use a little bit of community transport here. They'd get meals on wheels um, uh, when they come out of hospital, those sorts of things. But, you know, they don't really need those ongoing services. So they weren't really eligible for a package. So it, they haven't really released any information about mental health just yet. Um, I know that they're looking at it. Um, but it, the main thing to keep in mind is that initial, what Douglas said is true to a point. So initially they said there'll be that many people. Those were their projections. But those project, projections have been revised. And they're realizing that there are a lot more people out there in the community who do need those supports. So it's whoever is able to meet the legislative requirements gets a package. And uh, if you get knocked back, you can try again. And you, if, if you get knocked back again, you can try again. Or you could take it to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And I think the, the really the biggest gap is for carers. Because every carer service is in scope for the NDIS. So all the counselling, the money for the carer support groups, um, even respite to a certain extent, um, and carers can't, cannot purchase those services back. So there is no package for carers. I believe that your service is already being impacted by some of these changes. Yes, yeah, so we've had our um, funding cut uh, for this financial year, and then we'll go the next financial year, and then half a year, then we're finished, basically. Um, but a key th part of that thing is... Um, a condition of our funding is that uh, we actually focus on the NDIS and that we actually had to register as a provider with the NDIS. Um, and uh, so, so our main focus um, is meant to be getting our carers to get their care recipient to register for the NDIS. Um, so that, that needs to be a main focus for us. It's interesting because our funding's been reduced and that we're supposed to be a carer respite organisation. Fascinating. Anyway, um, uh, and if, if carers refuse to want to register, um, they're under our funding contract at the moment, then we are not supposed to provide them with a service? A lot of um, who's going to get left behind, it's, it's up to, um, I guess, the advocacy services to really advocate for everybody. Um, and it will get, it, I think it's going to be more, definitely more complex for people with mental illness than it is with people with other disabilities. Um, so we know at a Commonwealth level with some of the work that's happened already, oh sorry, some, some of the rollouts that have happened already, that um, people from culturally and linguistically diverse um, backgrounds are obviously um, getting packages. But with mental health and mental illness, we know um, less about this. So I think we, it's about 
um, keeping our eyes and ears open around um, what that's going to look like and then knowing what to do about it. So it's going to be um, really educating communities on the ground um, and for assessors it's going to be understanding their local demographics so that they actually uh, there's, there's some certainty, surety around um, them knowing who um, their population is because it's as basic as that with, with a lot of the work that we do on the ground, not just with NDIS but um, with mental health services. It's, it's local people knowing who, um, the, who is in their community. So that's one thing. In terms of the assessors, it's about cultural competency um, and, and knowing and understanding mental health issues um, and that they do vary um, and presentations vary a across cultures. So it's, it's going to be really um, <sighs> working with assessors and working with people that are rolling out and making decisions around the packages on understanding how to work with diverse population groups. I think that's really going to be um, mm -hmm. most important. And as for the advocates, it's basically advocating all the things that I'm, I'm mentioning at the moment. The reason why we've had such a big and eclectic panel today is because it's very hard for us to understand exactly who potentially is going to be negatively impacted by the changes to a scheme which should be really um, reducing the size of no man's land, the area where no one gets services for because there's too big an impediment. And those impediments can be consent. And in mental health and other areas related to cognitive impairment, but especially mental health, consent is a big problem. And I know that um, New South Wales Health is continuing to fund things like HASI and some other programs. And it would seem, if you just thought about it, that that would logically be swallowed up by the NDIS because it's providing ongoing support to live in the community for people who experience psychosocial disability. But if consent is an effective prerequisite for participation in the NDIS, and it's, it's not legally a, a requirement, but effectively it seems like the problems in getting support through the NDIS are too great unless consent can be more or less guaranteed on a fairly consistent basis, then maybe this is why health is still interested in funding these programs. And yet these people would be definitely among the 60,000, 65,000 most disabled people in New South Wales from psychosocial disability.